Scattered through history are a few true visionaries, people who rose above their culture and their time, whose revolutionary thinking and willingness to act changed the course of human history. In our last program, we met one of those visionaries, Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf, and learned of his involvement with the Moravian Renewal of 1727 in the tiny village of Herrnhut, Germany. This almost Pentecostal experience transformed a community of refugees into a dynamic renewal society whose outreach to the world would have extraordinary dimensions. The Count of the Holy Roman Empire was very much defined by the boundary of his estates, within which his word was law. Count Zinzendorf habitually stepped outside the borders, not only of his estate and his country, but the boundaries of expected behavior as well. He often offended his aristocratic peers by mingling freely with commoners, with slaves, with Native Americans, and treating them as equals in God's sight. In this program, we'll follow the controversial Count and his Moravians as they burst forth from their small German community to start mission work among the Native peoples from the Arctic Circle to the Cape of Good Hope at the southernmost tip of Africa. This would be the first mission movement to be organized by a Protestant denomination. The tiny group of religious refugees that had settled on Zinzendorf's lands had been touched by the Holy Spirit and transformed into a renewal powerhouse. Working within existing churches and denominational structures, they started meetings across Germany, informal renewal societies which transformed the lives of thousands of Lutheran and Reformed Christians. Despite his awareness of the Moravians' heritage as a distinct denomination, Zinzendorf struggled with their desire to reorganize the old Unitas Fratrum. Part of this was a legal concern that had to do with the structure of the state Lutheran Church. But part of the Count's resistance came from his larger vision of a non-sectarian renewal society, which could function among all denominations. They began to look around for ways that they could not only strengthen their own spiritual fellowship, but for ways in which they could share the word of Christ with people in a larger context. This happened when they became evangelists and revivalists in the state churches of Europe, and it happened when they began to go abroad in 1732 in cross-cultural mission. The seed of Moravian mission was planted when the Count was invited to attend the coronation of King Christian VI of Denmark, where he was presented with the Order of the Dannebrog, the highest recognition of distinguished service. On that trip, he met a Negro slave from St. Thomas in what is now the Virgin Islands, and was very taken with the story that Anthony had to tell. Zinzendorf came up upon a man called Anthony Ulrich, who was a slave from the Caribbean, who had gone to Europe with his master. While he was there, he came into contact with the, the church and had a change in life and wanted the same for his brothers and sisters on St. Thomas. And so when he met Zinzendorf, he related his experience and hoped that if the gospel was brought to the Virgin Islands, uh, that those persons who were enslaved uh, may too have a change of life. And when he went back to Herrenhut, the congregation was interested in hearing about the coronation, but all they heard about was the slave. To the point that Anthony visited Herrenhut and told his story, and growing out of that, Leonard Dober and David Nitschman and a few other brethren spent some pretty sleepless nights because they were hearing the call of God and so on August the 21st, 1732, the first two missionaries, namely Dober and Nitschman, left Herrenhut uh, to go to the West Indies. But how it was to be done, nobody had any idea, including Zinzendorf himself. Uh, he did take them in his carriage as far as Bautzen and uh, handed them a little pocket of money and said, go be missionaries. And so they did. 
And not only did they say, we've got to do that perhaps almost insane thing of go everywhere and bring this message. Um, we've got to do it no matter what the circumstances. And they went even further. It seems as though they picked the most desperate places. I think it's almost impossible for us today to realize how outrageous this must have appeared um, when they first began going. The Protestant denominations, unfortunately, have been so locked into theological debate and internal questions that there really wasn't that compassion for the world. Zinzendorf and his people cracked it open for us. The work was not easy. The slaves were suspicious, the plantation owners hostile. At first, uh, there was a great deal of objection. There, was t there were times when uh, white planters actually uh, attacked uh, physically both the missionaries and the slaves to whom they were ministering. It would be many months before the first convert was won, a boy named Carmel Oli. Zinzendorf had a global philosophy of mission work that focused on winning a few converts in a new area. These were known as the first fruits. Those converts would then be trained to become leaders and evangelists to their own people. The Count believed that these native helpers could reach their brothers and sisters better than visiting Europeans. While Leonard Dober and David Nitschmann struggled on St. Thomas, a new mission was begun far to the north, in Greenland. In 1733, Christian David, the founder of Heronhood, went with two other brothers to the Arctic to take the gospel to the Inuit people. They met with even more difficulties than Dober and Nitschmann had found in the Caribbean. The Inuits were suspicious, even hostile. The Europeans and Americans who were uh, prevalent along the coast at the time were whalers and fishermen, traders, fur traders, who had sometimes abused and been abused by the native people. And so there was a lack of trust, I would expect, amongst the visitors and the uh, native population. It would take five years of dedicated work in this icy land before the first convert would be won. We count practically the entire population of Labrador as our membership uh, for the fact that all of the North Coast communities were established by the Moravians as mission stations. Back in Heronhood, missionary zeal was growing beyond all efforts to contain it. It was at that time that Zinzendorf pursued his lifelong dream of becoming a Lutheran minister. He was examined by the faculty at the University of Tübingen in 1734. Such an improper pursuit for a nobleman irritated many of his relatives and other members of the aristocracy. But despite criticism, the work continued with increasing energy. In 1735, three missionaries were sent to South America to begin a work in Suriname. And the first missionary came here. They went first to the plantation, to the, the, the slaves. And after that, they went to the, to the Amur Indians, who were the original people here in, in, in Suriname. The missionaries brought with them Zinzendorf's respect for the indigenous culture and language, typical for the Moravian missionaries, but unusual for their day. And in a few months' time, they learned the, the language of the Arawaks and translated parts of the gospel into that language so they could communicate with, with, with the people and communicate the gospel with the people. The Moravian leader believed in gentle evangelism, a quiet invitation to those who are ready to believe. Zinzendorf believed that when you went to the foreign country, you needed to plant a congregation so that people would have a living expression of Christianity, so they could come and visit and see what uh, living with the Savior was like. 
Sinzendorf war auch in seinen Missionsgedanken seiner Zeit weit voraus. Er Sinzendorf war revolutionary in his missionary thinking. He told his people, don't go and preach, go and live with those in need. Don't just tell them about Christ, paint a living picture of Christ for them. The attitude of the missionary towards the colonials and mostly towards the, the, the slaves and the Indian was a kind of, of setting an example of what it meant and what it means to be human. A, cre a, a, cre a creation of God. More worldly observers were baffled by Zinzendorf's interest in African slaves and indigenous cultures. To most people in the 18th century, other races were lesser beings, fit only for domination and exploitation. Yet to Zinzendorf, each person mattered. Each was a person for whom the Savior had died. The mission effort was one of the few truly international interracial movements in the 18th century. Once a slave joined the community, they were given the same opportunity to, um, to become a Moravian, to go through the membership process as everyone else. Since I have said somewhere that uh, his working field is the world. So everybody, every nation, every race is part of the creation is part of the um, act of salvation of Jesus Christ. God has given me, be he thanked, a tireless spirit to further his honor and fame, a spirit that can never rest. Their next missionary undertaking was at the southernmost tip of Africa. The, the Moravian mission work really started in, um, in, in the Cape of Good Hope in the year 1737, when, when the Count Zinzendorf assigned a German missionary by the name of Georg Schmidt to do missionary work among the, the indigenous people of, of the Cape of Good Hope at the time. The Moravian Church is still a strong presence in South Africa, where the vision of Zinzendorf and the message of those early missionaries has given its members strength to face oppression and intolerance. We cannot really talk about South African history without talking about colonialism and, 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 and apartheid. The, the theology and teachings of, of Zinzendorf, you know, the, the knowledge of and understanding of the Word of God, the caring for your, for your congregation members, this, this brought uh, some strength and, and comfort to to the people, the Moravians of, of South Africa. Only a short time later, missions to the Gold Coast and Algeria would begin. But back in Germany, a storm of criticism would soon break over the controversial Count and his community of Moravians. Zinzendorf's movement in Herrenhut was uh, controversial from the beginning. He was uh, allowing uh, people to leave their feudal lords and come to his estate where he granted a, a certain amount of freedom. This angered many people in the imperial court. Another thing that worried the government in Dresden was that it seemed to be an independent religious organization. And both these, both, uh, these two complaints led to several investigations of Herrnhut and uh, it ended up in uh, the resolution that Zinzendorf had to leave and he was banished from Saxony. As controversy and criticism grew, Zinzendorf had taken the precaution of selling his estates to his wife, Erdmuth Dorothea, long before the order of banishment was handed down. This saved Herrenhut and may have saved the Count's personal finances as well, for the Count has turned out to be a skilled manager. Sie hat immer wieder sich erfolgreich bemüht. I would say that she built a bridge between his dreams, his visions, and reality. 
She always succeeded in bringing him down to earth and finding some practical way of accomplishing the dreams he'd laid out. Without Erdmus' management skills, Zinzendorf probably would have been bankrupt before his visions reached fruition. But his success was dependent on the practical skills of others as well, especially Bishop August Gottlieb Spangenberg, who had encountered the Moravians while a theological student and who came to be Zinzendorf's right-hand man, the administrator of the Moravian movement. Zinzendorf was the idealist, the dreamer, the theoretician. He could take scripture and see possibilities for missions and ministry coming out of it, but he was not the practical person to work it out. Like any good CEO of a company, he had great ideas. Zinzendorf, if nothing else, was an idea man. He just couldn't implement them. His mind didn't work on details enough. He was lucky to have people like Schwangenberg uh, to work those details out for him. Another practical organizer who implemented the Count's grand schemes was Baron Frederick von Wattville, who was a close friend since school days. The Baron accompanied the Count into exile, becoming part of the entourage known as the Pilgrim Congregation. A sympathetic Wetteravian Count invited them to use a partially ruined castle, and from this dark and dank structure, Zinzendorf began laying plans for a new community, to be named after the nearby Hag Church. There he set up a, a new congregation, Herrn Hag, that was laid out in a very grand way, big houses around square, and it became the uh, point of attraction for many, many people. They started building Herrn Hag in 1738, and within a few years they had around a thousand people living there. During this period, Zinzendorf was consecrated as a bishop of the Moravian Church, once again stepping outside the boundaries of expected behavior. Many throughout Europe followed news of this irrepressible community of missionaries and their noble Lutheran bishop with great interest. Their exploits became a topic of much conversation and not a little speculation. And you can only wonder what went on there that would cause these folks who had such a long history of uh, being exiled from their homeland, finally becoming settled in a place they could call their home, now deciding that they were going to disperse and go to all parts of the world. Reports spoke well of the bravery of the missionaries who faced ceaseless heat or numbing cold, the impersonal hostility of nature. Many died of tropical diseases. Back in Germany, Zinzendorf's increasingly vocal critics jeered that he was only sending his followers off to die. The Count concluded that he too must go to St. Thomas. The death toll was incredible. And um, Zinzendorf went to St. Thomas to prove he was willing to die as well. Uh, and he fully expected to die. He left his last will and testament, he gave his last sermon, and it was published as you know, his last discourse. Uh, he was fully prepared to not return from that trip. I have been commissioned by the Lord God to spread the word of Jesus' blood and death without concern as to what happens to me as a result. When he arrived on St. Thomas, he found that the missionaries had been imprisoned on false charges. Well, the first thing he did, of course, was to throw his noble weight around and have them freed, but it turned out that that incident was probably the best thing that could have happened for the mission because the slaves had been pretty resistant at that point and suspicious, and they saw in that false imprisonment that the slave owners treated the Moravian missionaries about the same as they treated the slaves. This incident broke down the walls of suspicion and hundreds of slaves began coming to the Moravian meetings to hear Zinzendorf speak. Within a couple of weeks, almost 800 slaves had accepted Christ. And even though Zinzendorf had only spent about two weeks here in, uh, in St. Thomas in 1739, apparently he respected the uh, culture of the slaves so much that in the great farewell address that he gave to the slaves, he actually rendered it in Dutch field 
everyone who uh, heard it were very uh, touched and it was something that, you know, made an impact on them for the rest of their lives. Zinzendorf then visited the new work on the neighboring islands. During this journey, he spent the many hours at sea on one of his favorite pursuits, writing hymns to the Savior. It was during this time that he wrote some of his most memorable lines. To our knowledge, Zinzendorf didn't write any music, but he wrote hundreds and thousands of hymn texts, and spiritual poetry, sacred poetry. We are very often impressed in doing the hymn translations at just how much meaning he can fit into just a line or two. Zinzendorf encouraged singing from memory, I think because you know it better that way. You sing it from the heart and not from the written page. His perception was that the printed hymnals are for the visitors. This emphasis on music and congregational singing was not new to the Moravians. It was just another way that they and Zinzendorf fit together well. The early unity had a strong musical tradition and had published the first hymnal for congregational singing in 1501. A high level of musical competence was expected of every Moravian, and they brought their musical traditions with them into the mission fields. The next targets for Zinzendorf and the Moravians would be Ceylon, off the coast of India, and the native tribes in the American colonies. They chose Georgia as a starting point. The Moravian part of the colony never really took off. Um, the land that they were given was swamp. There were um, just environmental problems. A lot of them got sick, a number of them died, some of them went back. What really kind of finished it off was that there was a war brewing between the Spanish colonists in Florida and the English colonists in Georgia. But while the Moravian colony in Georgia ultimately failed, the group of Savannah-bound Moravians had an enormous impact on a young Anglican priest named John Wesley. Wesley came to know uh, first the Moravians through uh, his shipboard acquaintance with them when he was on his way to Georgia as a young Anglican priest. He was very much uh, moved and interested when uh, the ship almost sank uh, and everyone else on board was terrified and the Moravians stayed in their, sp uh, in their place and they just continued doing what they did every evening and they were singing hymns and psalms and having their evening devotions. Uh, Wesley was, really was awed. When he returned to London, he was again um, really taken care of by Moravians. And in England, it was in particular a young man named Peter Böhler. This Moravian continued to give John Christian counsel, and it was one evening when uh, Peter Böhler came by the place where John Wesley was staying and wanted to bring him along to a Moravian meeting, and John said that he didn't want to go. Burler was insistent, dragged him along against his will, and at that meeting, John says, suddenly I felt my heart strangely warmed, and I knew that Jesus Christ really had died for me, that he loved me. And John sees that as a, really a turning point in his life. Wesley's brother Charles also was converted through his contact with Burler and the Moravians he would become one of the most prolific and best-loved hymn writers of all time. John Wesley visited with Zinzendorf in Germany and for a time was strongly influenced by the Count. But theological differences began to divide the two larger-than-life personalities, and eventually they went their separate ways, Wesley to begin the Methodist movement. Though John then took his um, Methodists, so they weren't quite called that yet, out of the Moravian society and had his own society meetings, his brother Charles actually never separated himself ever to the end of his life from the Moravians. Not... 
The Wesleys were not the only religious leaders to be strongly influenced by Zinzendorf and the Moravians. Wherever they went, they influenced others to find a deeper relationship with Christ. Many were attracted by their simple life, their fearless work, and their burning love for the Savior. Their presence has had an impact on many cultures and hundreds of thousands of individual lives. This astounding missionary effort came out of a tiny village of only 600 people. And while the Count was certainly wealthy, his resources probably weren't too much more substantial than those of a typical larger American church congregation. What that tiny group accomplished in a few years is almost beyond understanding. In our next program, the dynamic Count comes to America to try and create the first ecumenical movement and to meet with the chiefs of the Indian nations. For Comenius Foundation, I'm John Jackman. For more information on Count Zinzendorf and the Moravians, be sure to visit www.zinzendorf.com on the net, where you can also purchase other tapes in this series, or call 1-800-523-0226.